I'd love to be here in person, unfortunately, uh, uh, although I just live very closely in Santa Clara, I'm not able to be here in person. I had a bicycle accident last week and I'm still on crutches. And since I was told I only have 15 minutes, that's probably about the time it would take me to hobble from the door to the podium. So I better do it remotely. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is about a, a new payment device uh, of my company, very phone, that's called Carbon, and how we use WSO2's uh, EMM solution uh, to manage our devices. One second. So, um, so what is Carbon? Uh, you can see some pictures here. It's an entirely new payment terminal, which is what very phone traditionally does um, in a sleek design. So you can see here on the left side, uh, you can see it consists basically of two parts. One is an Android tablet, the larger one on the left side, which is facing to the merchant. Um, and then there's a smaller payment terminal with all kinds of payment uh, functionalities for the customer with uh, Apple Pay and credit cards, etc. cetera. Um, and this device is is placed on a base, which is mobile. So on the right side, you can see that you can remove the device from the base. The base is mainly for charging uh, Ethernet connection and has the receipt printer. Um, and um, the target customer, the target market really is small and medium businesses. So this is not for large uh, customers necessarily, large merchants. Um, it is semi-mobile, so you can carry it around within the, uh, within the store for maybe half a day or a little bit longer. And what's really uh, new about it is that it is embedded in a whole uh, ecosystem uh, that we call a commerce platform. And it consists of a number of additional platforms that provide more than just a typical payment terminal that so far Verifone has produced. Um, most importantly, we allow a uh, allow third-party developers to create their own apps. So there is a developer portal where uh, developers can download an SDK uh, using our APIs. APIs. Um, there is an app marketplace where these apps can be placed and can be purchased, similar to what Apple and Google do. Um, so this allows us to leverage applications that uh, include payment functionality. So it's all these SDKs. Uh, can trigger payments, can get information about succeeded or failed payments. Um, so, for example, they could uh, they could include some uh, commercials or some targeted promotions to our customer while he's in the process of paying for his uh, purchased items. There are a few more portals that kind of uh, are part of this commerce platform. One that's called a state owner portal which is a state is, is essentially the number of all devices. And the state owner is a large, large corporations that deal directly with the merchants. So it's not typically very fun doing that. Um, so in this portal, they can manage all the devices, have an overview of their devices, can manage their merchants, so create new merchants, remove them, update them, uh, as well as purchase apps for their merchants. Uh, and similar, the merchant portal allows a you know, smaller scope for the merchant only. They can see their devices uh, and can purchase apps uh, for their devices. And then there are the payment-related uh, services. The use cases, I mentioned one example, you have promotional uh, media and coupons, but you could also think of it like loyalty points. So maybe you can pay with air miles or you can get air miles when you, when you pay. Um, or you have specific promotion videos or coupons that are shown, potentially even tailored to one particular customer if there's a if they have a frequent flyer a frequent buyer card. Um, you can do all kinds of analytics for the purchase process, so it get, gets the merchants and also their estate owners much more information about the whole process. How, how, what do people buy? How often do they buy it, et cetera? So there's, it depends on what the third party developers uh, develop. So they have a wide range of options here uh, that we provide by our APIs. Um, another one is potentially invite customers to redeem personalized offers in real time. So these are just a few of the use cases uh, that we have in mind for this platform. Here are now. For all of this to happen, we somehow need to monitor and manage these devices. And that's where WSO2's EMM solution comes into place. Um, here I just 
you see some screenshots. I'm not sure how big you can see it, but it's uh, on the left side, you would see, for example, on the estate owner portal, you would see some kind of map where the devices are located uh, in a certain area, um, as well as a list of devices that have issues that have potentially need to be updated or where there were problems. Um, so you can see that color base. So to get this information, we need some kind of software to leverage this and, and to bring it into our backend. The other picture on the right side is the marketplace, which would be in this case on the Android side, it's an app similar to a Google Play Store where you can purchase apps. So somehow we need to trigger app installation automatically in the background uh, to the device. Another option here uh, would be similar, a list of alerts for a device. Uh, so you can see all the devices, a list of devices with, uh, with problems and you can then investigate what the problem is. Or on the right side here, you can also, this would be a UI uh, for managing devices, sending commands uh, such as software upgrade or installing a new software or rebooting the device. So that's kind of really the use case why we need this, uh, this, this kind of uh, software. Now, when we thought about uh, which software solution to take, we, we considered commercial solutions as well. Um, but we eventually decided to use an open source solution for multiple reasons. Um, one of the major reasons is, is cost. Some of the commercial offers are quite expensive. They are often paid per device. So since we plan to roll out, this is in a large scope with, with many devices, this could be potentially very expensive. The other reason is that it is often commercial solutions are more difficult to cost, get customizations done since you basically buy them out of the box with all their features that they have. But sometimes we needed our own customizations and that's much easier with uh, an open source solution where we can, uh, we can either ourselves modify the code or work with WSO2 and ask them to, to modify things. Um, it is also in our case, and I'm gonna go over that in, in some of the next slides, we have existing terminal management infrastructure and we basically add uh, the MDM solution on top of this. So this is much easier, we thought, by using an open source solution where we can also modify either the code or work with uh, the company to uh, adapt this and integrate it in our infrastructure. And, and, and finally, also, of course, since we can get the source code, we can, we're independent of anyone else. If we wanted to, we can have our own modifications of MDM agent or server side. So. That kind of were the reasons why we decided to use the EMM, Enterprise Mobility Management Tool from WSO2 uh, for our requirements and advance their existing tool. So I worked with WSO2 very closely with their developers over, I would say more than half a year, maybe nine months to, to fit their tools uh, to our requirements. Essentially what EMM is, and this is very short, I just posted the link here. Um, they have a way better web page there with, that ex explains it. But it is an open source platform for managing Android, iOS, and Windows devices. For us, we only use the Android part, um, at least for now. There are two components. It's an agent and a server. The agent is installed on the, on the device, so it's an Android APK file. Um, and the server it can be deployed either on prom premise or in the cloud. In our case, we put it in a public cloud in AWS. Um, they provide a UI uh, as well as APIs, uh, RESTful APIs. So we only use the APIs since we have, as you have seen from the previous screenshots, we have our own uh, UIs. And they integrate with a lot of other WSO2 products, um, which we also, some of them we use in particular for identity servers, SSO, OAuth, uh, as well as some other directory services like LDIP. Now, a little bit more technical. One thing that I thought could be interesting to talk about is how do we get these devices into the system? Um, so we ship out the devices basically blank. There is they're all the same. We want to use the same operating system image and not one per device, uh, evidently. Uh, but how does the, the MDM server identify the device and also authorize and authenticate them? The way we do this is using mutual TLS, which is only one of two options. Uh, EMM also supports OAuth. Um, I'm not going into that here. That would be another option. 
But basically, by using individual device certificates, we can identify and authorize the devices. Um, what you can see here on the screen is, is a simplified uh, process how this works. We have our own, uh, let's call it certificate service, and, and behind this is, is our own certificate authority, that uh, the de tablet on the, upon the first boot when it goes through the setup application, it's, it creates a certificate request and the certificate subject is based on the, the serial number of the device. So it's an essential part of that certificate request and is sent in the first step to the certificate service, which returns and signs the CSR and returns a valid certificate. And from then on, uh, the tablet has the certificate which it can use for mutual TLS for authenticating itself to the MDM server. And MDM then knows because the certificate includes the uh, the serial number of the, the tablet inside the certificate, it can authorize the, the tablet and know the serial number and that thus uniquely identify it. That's kind of one thing that uh, we worked on uh, during this process uh, with, with WSO2 to make this happen. Now I mentioned um, that we integrated MDM or I say it MDM, but it, the, the product name is EMM in our solution where we already have a, a terminal management system called abbreviated TMS here in this figure on the top right side. Um, so this is kind of an overview of how it looks like. It's at, the, at the bottom, you can see the two components of our payment solution. You remember that we have the Android tablet and the payment terminal, and they are connected over your USB connection. So they, there's some communication ongoing between them. And then we have our legacy terminal management system that traditionally manages all the terminal functions. Terminal is based on a, on a Unix derivative, derivative, so it's a completely different operating system. It cannot use uh, Android features, which is one of the reasons why we decided to, instead of extending our TMS, uh, use EMM and for the communication with the tablet side. So one example would be, let's say we want to send a command to the tablet, say do an operating system upgrade. So we want to send it to that tablet identified by its serial number A. Um, it'll realize that this device, it has it in its database that this is a, a command that is for the Android side. So it will communicate with the RESTful API of the MDM server using that same serial number. And the tablet pulls periodically for new commands. Um, so there's a queue for each of the devices. And if there's any new dev any new command, it will be returned to the tablet. And then in step four and five, it would uh, re return their success status. Um, polling is only one of the options. So in the future, we want to switch to a push-based model. Um, but th since we don't use the Google Play services, that's currently not uh, possible. So right now they're all polling. One, as I mentioned, we don't use the UI of EMM. So one thing that was very important to us is how we can use EMM basically as a black box. We, uh, we just call it from our TMS. We call it uh, send commands as well as monitor. We get information about a device, but we don't really need to know what's, how it happens or how EMM exactly works internally. That meant that we needed a thorough list of uh, APIs, RESTful APIs, and I worked closely with uh, WSO2 on all these APIs um, to, to fit all of our requirements. We documented them in Swagger. So as you, on the right side, you can see an example uh, of how this can look like. I don't know if, if all of you have worked with Swagger. It's a really great tool for uh, describing, on the one hand, describing, documenting, um, RESTful APIs, but also to actually experimenting with them. So in this example, you can always, for each call, you can basically uh, set the payload and then click on a button, try it out, and it'll send the payload to the MDM server, and then uh, you will see the response, HTTP response. So it's a very nice tool for verifying the correctness also of the APIs. What do we use EMM mostly for? Um, there are way more features than we actually use, so we only use a subset. Uh, most important one is we get it device information, um, including the location of the devices, so longitude, latitude, so we can display it on the map, but also other information such as installed software, 
um, current version of the operating system, um, memory, available memory, battery level, uh, level etc. We do uh, one other very important feature is what's called OTA, over the air upgrade, which is a feature provided by Google APIs um, for upgrading the whole operating system. And M EMM leverages this by downloading the OTA images and triggering the installation. Uh, we install Android applications, so the APK file format, we install them, update, remove them in the background so the user is not bothered by installation uh, of the APKs, of APKs. There is a possibility for locking a device, permanently locking it. This would be if uh, the device has been stolen, for example, or uh, has been otherwise abused, so we, or bill hasn't been paid. So we can lock the device. We can reboot the device. Um, there's a factory reset feature. One feature is more for debugging, sending the whole log cat, so the, the Android logs uh, up to the server, and then sending notifications that pop up on the, on the tablet. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how we plan to scale this. So initially, of course, you start out with one uh, MDM server, but then um, once we have more devices, we'll have to scale this in a much larger scope. So this is a simplified uh, diagram de depicting this. So there will we use, as I mentioned, we use everything in AWS in the cloud. So we have an elastic load balancer uh, provided by AWS which then forwards all the requests to one or more workers of EMM server in an auto-scaling group, so that they will auto-scale automatically. If there are, there are more requests, we can scale, uh, turn up more instances. And then uh, eventually the files will be stored in S3, so the APK files, for example, um, and all the instances uh, communicate with an, a database system to get the information. Now, in reality, uh, it's a little bit more complicated than this, which you can see here, for a simple reason that the ELB, they cannot do the uh, TLS, mutual TLS that I described earlier in this talk, uh, which I hope eventually they will, which would simplify greatly this architecture. But since they don't, essentially we have two ELBs, one external ELB, which forwards the requests to one or more uh, instances running Nginx, uh, the web server. And in this case, Nginx is really only used for the TLS termination and for the uh, mutual TLS. So it verifies that the certificate is correctly signed. And what it will do is because EMM still will, will need to know the serial number of the device, it will put it in a HTTP header that's forwarded then internally. And so the communication goes from Nginx towards an internal load balancer and then to the EMM workers. So that's currently uh, the architecture that we use. Hopefully in the future, once AWS supports mutual TLS, we can get rid of this and basically go back to our simpler version like this.